the day of the Lord will come. Will it be a good day? Or will it be a day of judgment against us? One of the saddest of the Psalms, and I'm turning to it, is Psalm 74. Psalm 74 is written by a man named Asaph. Sometimes we get that. Make sure I'm on. Glad to see all of you tonight. Wow, it's louder than it's been. <laughs> Turn to Daniel chapter 3. got a uh, remarkable truth to share with you before we get started, and that is the distance between here and Oak Grove is exactly the same as what it is from Oak Grove here. Did you all know that? <laughs> These Oak Grove people have come and encouraged us so much. And uh, I don't know how many of you might be able to do it, but uh, I'm looking forward to being Oak Grove beginning the second Sunday of January. And if any of you can make your way over there as they've made their way over here, we sure would like to see you. You might have to remind me who you are, but uh, at the same time, uh, I'd pick that up right away. And uh, I, I would encourage you, if you could, to come and encourage us. Well, this is the last night of the meeting, and uh, it has just been such a good three days. Uh, in some ways, I uh, hate that we are actually closing tonight. Uh, there's been such a good interest, but I think that this being your first meeting for a while, it's probably wise that we're doing that, but I sure have enjoyed being here. You all have received me so well, and uh, the... Uh, the good place to stay where I've had has been just wonderful. And they have treated me wonderfully. And I appreciate very much Ben and Jennifer and their hospitality as well as those others of you who have extended hospitality. It's, it's just been tremendous. Thank you. And I wish all of you well. You, I know you've been through some rough times, but with God's help, you're on your way. And may the Lord open many doors to you, enabling you to bring people to Christ and see an increase in the family of God through your work. Well, in Daniel chapter 3, I'm just going to read a few verses and then we'll talk about the chapter and then begin to make other comments. Look at verse uh, 16 beginning. Daniel 3 verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. And we're going to talk tonight about God is able to deliver. But let's look at the context, first of all. And that is um, Nebuchadnezzar had built a gold image, 60 cubits high. Now, if our understanding of what a cubit is, that would mean that gold image was 90 feet tall. That would be quite an image. And the decree went out that when certain instruments played, everybody was to bow down and worship the gold image that Nebuchadnezzar had made. Well, there's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're Jews. They can't worship that golden image. But you can imagine the pressure that they would have felt. First of all, they're a long way from home. 
They're a long way from anybody who cares what they do. There's a governmental decree. Some people have the idea that if the government tells you to do something, you just have to do it, whatever. That's not true. Peter and the other apostles put that idea to rest in Acts 5, 29. We ought to obey God rather than men. And then everybody's doing it. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego must have stood out like a sore thumb. Everybody's bowing, and there they are, standing erect. And there's impending death in a burning, fiery furnace. And they're given a second chance. You know, sometimes when just on the spur of the moment we're put on the spot, we might do what's right. But give us time to think about it. We might come up with a hundred reasons why maybe we shouldn't do that. Well, here's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they're given a second chance. They have time to think about this and, and the impending consequences if they don't bow down to that gold image. In fact, look at uh, verse uh, 19. With my 85-year-old eyes and the tiny numbers, if you catch me holding off a little bit, that's the reason I, I have trouble seeing those numbers. All right, uh, verse um, 13, is that what I said? Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you're ready, at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony, with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? I love their answer. Now, we've already read it, but I think it's worth reading again. Here's what they answered. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand O king but if not let it be known to you O king that we do not serve your gods nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up what i really like about that is god is able to save us and if he saves us good but if he doesn't save us it doesn't really matter we do not worship your gold image God saved them. <clears throat> Look on down at verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O, God, o king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. God delivered them. God is able to deliver. Now what's our point tonight? The same God who delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from that burning fiery furnace is the same God who can del deliver us from a worse fiery burning furnace. I'm talking about hell. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm going to start with verse 7. I think we can get the idea if we begin there. And to give you her trouble, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord 
and from the glory of his power. Hell is pictured as a place of darkness where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It is a place where there's no rest day nor night, where the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and where there's tribulation, anguish, indignation, and wrath. That's hell. And it's eternal. Sometimes we sing, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. But the same thing is true of hell in the suffering that we will have. When we've been there 10,000 years, it's only the beginning. We don't talk enough about hell. I don't like to talk about it. But we don't talk enough about it to create the fear of hell that there ought to be in our lives. And the Bible talks about it. It's hell. And it's away from the presence of God. Can you be, can you possibly imagine being in a place where you never hear God's name, never hear anybody pray, Never hear anybody sing a song of praise. You're totally abandoned from God. Eternally. But the good news is, you don't have to go to hell. Jesus died that you might not have to go to hell. That your sins could be forgiven. God is able to deliver I'm turning to Acts chapter 2. We've used this passage quite a bit this week. Acts chapter 2, but I want to go into some detail. The interesting thing is we're on the day of Pentecost, the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And these people who later are going to be Christians got up that morning and never dreamed that they were on the way to hell. They thought they were fine. They're Jews, they're devout men out of every nation under heaven. And besides that, they haven't been deceived by this deceiver named Jesus. They haven't been deceived by him. They've stood against him. In fact, they've contributed to his crucifixion. They think that they're just super good as they get up that morning. And then the Holy Spirit comes on the apostles. And the apostles begin to speak in languages which they've never studied. And the people began to assemble, wondering about the ability of these apostles to speak in all these languages. And it opens the door for them to be able to teach the gospel. Somebody speaks up and says, well, probably they're drunk, they're full of new wine. Uh, Peter said, no, we're not drunk. As you suppose, it's just the third hour of the day. This is what Joel was talking about. And then they began to preach the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. Let's start with verse 22 of Acts chapter 2. Many brethren, let me speak to you freely to you of the patriarch David, that he both, I'm sorry, verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him, in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that they should be held by it. And then he begins to quote for David. What's he preaching? You know Jesus was approved of God. You know he performed great miracles. But you took him, and by the hands of Gentiles, you put him to death. God raised him up. And then he begins to give evidence of the resurrection. And by the time Peter gets through, they know we have crucified our Messiah. Look at verse 36 of Acts chapter 2. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly 
that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? I'm not a very dramatic preacher. You know that by now. But if I were and tried to somehow come out with that question with the inflection of voice that they must have said it, I would never be able to duplicate it. Think about these people. They have suddenly understood we have crucified our long-awaited Messiah. And remember, they know the law. These are Jews and devout men, verse 5 says. They know the law. They remembered Nadab and Abihu and fire coming out from the Lord and devouring them. They know about Korah and the earth swallowing them up. They know about Uzzah. And here they have done things that seem worse than what any of those men did. They have crucified their Messiah. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls. God is able to deliver. 3,000 people that day delivered from their sin. God is able to deliver us from the fear of death. Turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Start with verse um, 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he, that's Jesus, himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. God is able. He, can, he is able to deliver us from our sins. He is able to deliver us from the fear of death. Let me make this mention, or make this point. He's able to deliver us by means of death. Turn to 2 Timothy. I want to go to chapter 4. Look at verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me, may it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be pre pre preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Now, in that case, he's delivered from death. But now let's just keep reading. And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul, I thought you'd just written. It's all over for me. In verse 6, I'm now ready to be offered. Time of my departure is at hand. I've fought a good fight. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness. Paul, you just said that you're at the point of death. And here, here you're saying, the Lord will deliver me. I don't know any interpretation to put on that. Except Paul is seeing death as a means 
of delivery. And you know, we'd all do well to see death as that. I think of the children of Israel when they landed, went into the Canaan land. They were delivered from all the troubles and cares that they had faced in the wilderness, and now they've entered into the promised land where they have rest. And so it is in regards to us. I just think of people, and you know I've been there. I've seen everything. Alzheimer's patients, you have too. People who have suffered tremendously. My wife, for years, and then toward the end of life especially. And then death comes. And here's a Christian, serve the Lord all their life. And they're delivered from all that they have suffered. Delivered from that. And brought into a, a, a situation of comfort and joy. God is able to deliver. He can deliver us from sin. He can deliver us from the fear of death. He can deliver us from death if he chooses to do so. And he can deliver us through death into peace and joy and comfort. He is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace of hell. Are we familiar with the term day of the Lord? It's a term that runs through the scriptures. The term day of the Lord refers to a time when God comes with judgment upon a people while at the same time delivering his own people. I'll give you an example. Egypt. When God came and delivered his people out of the land of Egypt, he brought judgment against the land of Egypt. But as he brought judgment against the land of Egypt, he delivered those who were his own people. It was a day of the Lord. When Babylon came and destroyed Jerusalem, took the people off into captivity, it was a day of the Lord. It's called that. It was judgment against the nation of Judah in all of his corruption and idolatry. And the temple was destroyed. One sad thing is, there are people sometimes who long for the day of the Lord. They just know that the day of the Lord will be a time of relief for them. But unfortunately, oftentimes the day of the Lord is not what those people really want. I'm going to let me show you that. I'm going to the book of Amos over in the Old Testament. You have Hosea, Joel, Amos. And I'm not doing that for your sake. I do that for my sake. <laughs> Amos chapter 5. Here are people who are longing for a day of the Lord. Amos chapter 5. I'm starting with verse 18. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or as though he went into the house, leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Is it not very dark with no brightness at all? Can you imagine these people? And they're saying, oh, I wish we could have a day of the Lord. The Lord says, the day of the Lord won't be any comfort to you. It'd be just like you came across a lion, and just about the time you escape from the lion, you come across a bear, and just about the time you escape from the bear, you get in the house and lean your hand up on the wall and say, Whew, and a snake got you. The day of the Lord won't be a time that'll be good for you. What I'm trying to challenge all of us with, the day of the Lord will come Will it be a good day? Or will it be a day of judgment against us? One of the saddest of the Psalms, and I'm turning to it, is Psalm 74. Psalm 74. 
Psalm 74 is written by a man named Asaph. Sometimes we get the 